Well, hello, and welcome to the Engineering Biology Research Consortium Education Module on Synthetic Biology and Machine Learning. I'm Mary Dunlop. I'm a professor of biomedical engineering at Boston University. In this series, we are talking with researchers who work at the interface of synthetic biology and machine learning about projects in their group and ideas about how to learn more about this area. Um, we're joined by, today by um, Howard Salas, a professor of bio biological engineering and chemical engineering at Penn State University. Um, and in this discussion, we're going to be talking about a manuscript from his lab on a promoter calculator model that can be used to accurately predict transcription initiation rates for Sigma 70 promoter sequences. Um, the study was conducted by graduate students Travis Lafleur and Ayan Hussein, um, and is currently available as a preprint on BioArchive. Welcome, Howard. Hello, hello, everyone. So I, we'll get into the modeling parts of the work in a, in a little bit, but could you start out by telling us about the, the overall goal of the study? Uh, sure. So, um, you know, when, when you are engineering a genetic system, I, th I think we can all agree that it's very important to control transcription rates. And in the past, we've pretty much relied upon uh, characterizing, you know, uh, promoters as, you know, modular genetic parts. Uh, and as I can show you, um, you know, we even though we think of a promoter region as being solely responsible for controlling transcription rate, it's actually quite common uh, that uh, sequences outside what we call the promoter can affect transcription rates, and promoter sequences can actually appear anywhere inside of a genetic system, whether you want them to be there or not. <laughs> um, and so this goes into sort of like an overarching theme of my lab, that is, you know, when you're engineering a complex system, it's really important to be able to quantitatively predict how that system will perform in the desired environment. And you can't make too many assumptions about what is going to happen versus what's not going to happen. You need to be able to predict what's going to happen. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that requires understanding the biophysical interactions and the strengths of those interactions, controlling each of the different processes taking place. Once you are able to make those predictions, then you can combine those predictions with automated computational optimization of the genetic systems sequences. And mm -hmm. we're not talking about just the short sequence that you, know, you might uh, be focused on, but it's really the whole sequence of the mm -hmm. whole genetic system that we optimize. Mm -hmm. And we do that in order to, of course, um, get the things that we want. So if you want a particular transcription rate for a particular promoter, you get that. But you also want to remove the things that you don't want to minimize the you know, transcription from other positions in the system uh, that you don't want. Um, and it's, it's important also that you know, we haven't just developed one model for just transcription. I think mm -hmm. many people are aware that we've developed a whole toolbox of predictive right. models covering transcription, translation, mRNA decay, uh, translational coupling, CRISPR, you know, ribosome regulation, and so on. Mm -hmm. And so we're getting to the point where we've, we have combined several of these models together into an overarching design algorithm so that instead of you know, worrying about this and worrying about that, wondering if this is going to affect that or, and so on, you just type in what you want and you mm -hmm. type in design rules for what you don't want. And of course, we have a default set of, mm -hmm. of such design rules. And then you hit the button, and it will then automatically generate the DNA sequence of your genetic system predicted to behave like, you know, how you want it. Um, and, you know, if we think back uh, historically, such a DNA compiler or, you know, design algorithm uh, th these are really essential steps to making engineering biology more of an engineering discipline. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, we, we can compare it to, uh, let's say, in the electrical engineering world, uh, you know, back when people laid out transistors by hand, uh, it was very, you know, artisanally crafted microchips. Uh, it was very difficult. And you could only, you know, keep in your head, uh, this, you know, the small set of rules for how to place those transistors. And as soon as you got over a hundred transistors, uh, you know, or, or gates or whatever, uh, that's when things got out of hand. Uh, so we're now approaching a similar situation in synthetic biology. Yeah. If you ask someone to artisanally craft a 
small, simple genetic circuit, uh, they'll be able to keep all of those design rules uh, in their head and, and design things. And, you know, after several rounds of trial and error experimentation, they can get that system to work. But when systems get more complicated with 10 regulators, 20 regulators, 10 enzymes, 20 enzymes all working together, that's when you need an automated design algorithm that keeps track of everything for you so you can focus on the most important things. And by, you know, of course, you check the results of all of, your, of all of the predictions and all the, uh, you know, optimization to make sure that everything looks good. It's not a black box. But when you know what's coming in and you know what's coming out, you have actually a lot more control over the system that you're engineering. Hmm. That's great. Yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about the um, the promoter calculator algorithm in particular. Um, and I love your vision for um, being able to, to generate parts. We'll talk a little bit more about that later because I think that's going to be incredibly impactful for, for synthetic biology research. Let me show some data uh, just to motivate the development of this promoter calculator uh, model. Um, so, you know, we think of promoter genetic parts as like modular and interchangeable. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, you know, if we take the same 40 base pair uh, protein coding sequence, you know, the very commonly used J23101 promoter, uh, and you, if you change the 20 base pairs before the promoter and the 20 base pairs uh, after the promoter, keeping in mind that the 20 base pairs after that promoter is part of the messenger RNA. So we change that very commonly, right? Um, so if you change those sequences surrounding J23101, you vary transcription rates by about tenfold, mm -hmm. okay? And this says that the part that we think of when we say promoter, it's not really encompassing all of the interactions between the DNA and RNA polymerase and sigma factor. There's mm -hmm. other interactions that fall outside the boundaries of what we as humans call a promoter sequence um, that the, the biophysics actually tells us, no, actually these interactions are important. They vary transcription rate. And so when I say we shouldn't make these assumptions about what we're doing, this is one of those assumptions that it's very common in the field. Promoters yeah. or modular genetic parts, the Legos, interchangeable. I mean, it's are the they... whole BioBricks vision, right? <laughs> you can plug and play. Yeah. Uh -huh. That is correct. Mm -hmm. And, but you know, in other engineering disciplines, there's mm -hmm. this, there's no necessary concept of modularity. Like you would never say that a, 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 a continuous stir tank reactor, CSTR, is a modular interchangeable, right? If you take uh, two different CSDRs, they have to be like, you know, identical for mm -hmm. them to be functionally equivalent. If you change something about them, you know, all bits are off. And also the flow rates going in and out, you know, it's just not, it's not, this, it's not required mm -hmm. uh, of a concept. Okay. Um, so that's some pretty good motivation for why we're doing this in the first place. The other bit that I, I want to show everyone is that, you know, where can a promoter be? in a genetic system. We draw lines, right? We draw those arrows and we say, oh, there's the promoter. And that's a form of abstraction. And abstraction is very useful, it's very important so that we can look at a diagram and see a system and understand it you know, very well. But the diagram is a simplification of the system. And sometimes it oversimplifies and misses what's actually taking place. And so in this, um, you know, in this recent paper uh, from uh, Amin Esbab Orjeni out of the Voigt Lab at MIT, uh, they characterized, you know, very extensively characterized a seven repressor genetic circuit. And some of what they found is that there are promoters inside coding sequences. Mm -hmm. And if you have a constitutive promoter inside the middle of a coding sequence, it will transcribe downstream and express proteins you know, downstream of, uh, of that coding sequence, which could be another repressor or another regulator. Mm -hmm. And by always expressing that regulator uh, and, and having it uncontrolled in your genetic circuit, you are effectively either attenuating the performance of your genetic circuit or completely breaking it, depending upon the severity of that internal promoter. 
Um, and that's what they found. They found that a lot of the uh, malfunctions or unexpected behaviors that they saw when they you know, added different combinations of inducer to their genetic circuit were due to the presence of these internal genetic parts that are mm-hmm. cryptic, undesired, uh, were not labeled you know, originally, um, yeah. and were only really uncovered by this very extensive transcriptomic and proteomic and riboseq. Um, mm-hmm. so, um, and so we want to get to a point where we don't have to do massive, extensive characterization of every single system to see what's going on. Uh, we want to get to the point where with automated design, you know, this just doesn't happen. You know, you yes. don't have motors. You know, go through this process um, when they're designing a synthetic circuit. Yeah. That's right. Okay, so that's, you know, the bit about motivation. What data did we collect? So uh, we designed and characterized 14,206 promoter sequences. And you might be thinking, well, to some people, that's a pretty big number. Mm -hmm. To other people, that's a small number. Oh, right. (laughs) So um, it's... Machine learning could be tiny, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, I mean... um, it's like a clash of worlds, right? You, you talk to a biochemist, uh, oh, 14,200, that's a lot. That's, you know, um, that's several genomes worth of promoters. Um, now in the machine learning world, uh, you know, depending on the algorithm, you might need millions or billions of data points. And we can talk about that. Uh, but something that's very important that is missing in this conversation of the number of data points And everyone likes to, uh, you know, publish and read papers with, you know, huge numbers of data points, right? Um, But we should really be focusing also on the quality of the data Mm -hmm. and the precision of the measurements. Because, of course, it's not just the quantity of data. It's the information content of the data set that Mm -hmm. is important. And so, yeah, all other things being equal, more data is better. But if you've got a lot of noise in your data or just a huge number of confounding factors in your data, then that means it's actually not that useful, even though Mm -hmm. there's a lot of it. So we should be more nuanced in our discussion uh, of the data set. We should be asking pretty critical questions like, what are the error bars on all of your data points? Mm -hmm. Rather than simply saying, oh, you've got a lot of data, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Okay. Uh, and and I'll, I'll point to this by the, a key novelty of the, of the work that we did is that we characterize these promoters in an in vitro transcription assay where there's only four ingredients and we are precisely measuring the interactions between RNA polymerase and sigma factor and the DNA sequences of, the, of these promoters. Mm-hmm. Okay. And we're reading out the transcription rates via next-gen sequencing much like other, you know, massively parallel reporter assays. Mm-hmm. Okay. So once we uh, have collected that data, and I'll talk more about that, uh, we then create the model. Um, and, uh, you know, we call it a hybrid biophysical machine learning model. It's hybrid because we're taking the best of both worlds. That is, we are enumerating and tallying and accounting for all of the biophysical interactions that we're hypothesizing are taking place inside this system that are important. Mm -hmm. And then we're using the machine learning to learn the interaction coefficients corresponding to each of those interactions. And and of course, which machine learning algorithm can do this? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's really not, uh, the, 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 you know, I'll go more into detail, but it's, it's actually more about the intelligent usage of mm-hmm. machine learning and not just using the latest and greatest right, right. that have been developed. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on, on this and hopefully you'll go into this a little bit more, um, like which models you considered using. And then, um, the other thing I was interested in talking with you about was like, you do this sort of abstraction where you identify specific features that you're, you're, you consider working with um, and then winnow that down. But um, 
can you compare and contrast that to just starting with like raw sequence data using like a sort of one hot encoding style approach? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm just going to say what the model does. This is the yeah. output of the typical model uh, of the uh, model calculation. We scan across DNA sequence. We predict transcription initiation rate at each nucleotide position. In order to get this to work, it can't just be a machine learning model with one hot encoding, just to let you know, because mm -hmm. that sort of model doesn't typically generalize across larger input sequences than it mm -hmm. had been trained on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And this is something that is important to realize when people see it. Certain types of machine learning are only ever applicable towards a training or a test set that looks a lot like this, what, what it was trained on or tested mm -hmm. on. As you extrapolate beyond, things break down. Okay. But the model that we developed can be applied to arbitrary DNA sequences of any length. Yeah, so how, can you talk a little bit more about, about how that works? Yeah. Sure. All right. So the first step, these are 14,206 promoter sequences but they're not random. Mm -hmm. They are you know, very rationally designed to systematically perturb the interaction strengths between RNA polymerase and sigma factor 70 and the promoter DNA. So what does that mean? It means that we read a lot of papers, right? We you know, really uh, synthesized and compiled all of the interactions that had never been discovered or noticed or mentioned even uh, between uh, in this system, okay, um, but you know, and, and and certainly there's a lot of you know a lot of prior work on the canonical interactions, the ones that you know are the strongest of the interactions, right? But a lot less on the non-canonical weak interactions. Mm -hmm. So you have to take what you've read and sort of you know think ahead and say, all right, well, they measured a really strong interaction with this particular motif. But of course, there are many other possibilities. Those are going to be much weaker interactions. And so, what do we do? We um, so we do, we I can I can show you real quick. But um, but overall, these are the the interactions that were that were modified. Uh, we've got the hexaber uh, motifs. These are uh, six nucleotide or six base pair uh, DNA sequences that interact with the sigma seventy uh, factor. Uh, as you know, individual domains. Uh, there's a negative 10 extended motif, uh, also interacts with sigma 70. The up element interacts with the alpha subunits of RNA polymerase. Here it's showing the number of promoter sequence variants that we designed for each of the different interactions that were systematic and perturbing. Mm -hmm. And yes, we can construct and characterize many, many, many sequences at the same time, but it's not, you know, millions, billions, right? Because right. we don't have the technology to uh, to construct a defined number of sequences mm -hmm. uh, with, uh, you know, unlimited, uh, you know, capacity. So we do have to pick and choose, mm -hmm. okay? Um, but importantly, the, the reason why we're picking defined sequences is because we can actually perturb individual interactions, measure their effects, and get really good interaction coefficients for those interactions. And then when we combine all those interactions together, that's when we can make you know, predictions and, and test those predictions for the synergistic usage of those mm -hmm. interactions. Okay, that's our overall strategy. Um, all right, so that's, that's the design of this oligo pool. And, and we do take great effort to make sure that every single one of these variants um, is, um, tells us something important about transcription but also mm -hmm. during the data analysis is uniquely identifiable. Yeah. And then when we take that oligo pool, of course, we uh, first step is PCR, uh, then a digestion ligation reaction. Uh, and we take that vector that is carrying our system. We digest it uh, as well. Uh, and so in, that, in this intermediate step, we get a, a, a plasmid library that contains our oligo pool with the barcode but you'll notice that this, you know, it's a promoter region, but it's not expressing anything, okay? Which is important because in the next step, we digest this 
and we digest a constant region which contains the you know the the, the transcript and the protein that is being expressed mm -hmm. we ligate them together and then we get our final plasmid library which contains our pool of different promoter sequences each transcribing uh, the same RBS, same coding sequence, aha, but the barcode is now in the three prime UTR of the system. Mm -hmm. That's important because we did not want to place the barcode sequence nearby the promoter region. Uh -huh. Because again, if you jumble up the, the nucleotides next to the promoter sequence, mm -hmm. you can have weird effects. Yeah. You could change transcription rates. Uh, if you were were to put this inside the cell, you could change translation rates uh, and so on. So all sorts of weird confounding factors. Mm -hmm. But if you put it in the three prime UTR, uh, you know, particularly in vitro, uh, in, in vitro, there are zero confounding factors. In vivo, you know, modest to, to nil uh, confounding factors. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and then we verified everything by MySeq. Uh, we measured library coverage. And out of this, we got 13,481 barcoded plasmas. Next, uh, data, data and the data quality. So again, our in vitro transcription assays only have the four ingredients, RNA polymerase sigma 70 enzyme, our plasmid library pool, the fuel, NTPs, uh, and buffer. Mm -hmm. what, what is not in this assay, there are no RNAs. So we don't need to worry about mm -hmm. RNAs chewing up our RNA and uh, and giving us, you know, truncated products. We also mm -hmm. don't need to worry if any of our changes to the transcript accidentally altered the decay rate of the messenger RNA, which is a thing. So yeah. the specifically, the first three nucleotides of a messenger RNA transcript can change the mRNA decay rate by tenfold. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Remember, that's part of the promoter. Mm -hmm. that's, that's part of the region controlling mm -hmm. transcription rate. Mm -hmm. So you can't separate those two effects inside the cell. Um, okay. So, um, which means inside this test tube, we're only having transcription take place. That's it. And we're, we're measuring the amount of messenger RNA being produced from all these different you know, promoter sequences. So in terms of data analysis, it's very straightforward. Mm -hmm. Now, the other bit is that we don't just measure mRNA levels. We also measure the location in which transcription started, the transcription mm -hmm. start site, you know, mapping. Uh, and we do that by, you know, purifying uh, the RNA that was produced, circularizing it uh, with, a, with an adapter region, uh, and then uh, PCR amplifying uh, uh, an amplicon that contains both the barcode and the beginning of that messenger RNA. Um, and so it tells us, you know, we, we basically look at the TSS region uh, during transcription source site mapping, and we look for the, you know, where the, you know, transcription began um, next to the adapter, and we, you know, mark a plus one on our counting. Okay. Um, and so, we really have two types of data that we are using uh, to generate our model. You know, the, the locations where trans, uh, transcription took place and started, uh, and the amount of messenger RNA that was produced from each of the promoters. And you'll notice that, you know, even though we're, you know, experts on transcription mm -hmm. and how to design a promoter, yes, we got, you know, expected locations where transcription started, but in a subset of the data, you know, minority, but still a subset, mm -hmm. there was a, you know, downstream promoter that started transcription at an unexpected downstream position. And this happens a lot, actually, if you have like a weak promoter sequence with non-canonical interactions, mm -hmm. then it's more likely that RNA polymerase, a sigma factor, will go off and bind someplace else and initiate transcription someplace mm -hmm. else. And if you didn't know that, then you would skew your data set, mm -hmm. right? It would look like you, the weaker promoters had stronger transcription rates, yeah. but that's not true. They just mm -hmm. bound someplace else. Yeah. Okay. 
Machine learning doesn't know anything about this. As we all mm -hmm. know, it's a machine. You tell it what to do and it does it. Mm -hmm. We know, or we should know these differences. And so we have to think about these differences and make sure that we as humans are setting up the math problem correctly yeah. before we even start. And you know, we get the data that we need to get a good answer. Yeah, interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, and we got very high coverage, you know, read coverage uh, across the library. So again, there's like, you know, 13,000 ish uh, plasmids, but mm -hmm. there's 80 million plus reads per sample. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, which means that our minimum reads per promoter are very high. Mm -hmm. like, you know, really several hundred, you know, for the lowest. Uh -huh. Okay. Most of them have, you know, thousands, 10,000 million, you know, ten, you know, tens of thousands of reads uh, is the, you know, the median, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, and and which, which means that these are more precise uh, than, again, uh, it's really important when you see a machine learning model that was trained on a lot of data, go back and look at that data. Just take a yeah. quick peek. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Make mm -hmm. sure... It meets your, you know, your criteria for a good data set. Uh, if you see read counts that are like zeros and, and ones and twos, mm -hmm. um, that's not good. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, if we have a promoter that looks like that, we, we just discard it. We, we have a pretty strict uh, read count uh, mm -hmm. filter. Because mm -hmm. again, our goal is not just to do the work. Our goal is to create a very accurate and generalizable model. Okay, um, now I'm going to give some background on how we frame the model. Okay, and in the uh, biophysical world, you know, when you when you take a very complicated cyclic process like transcription, and you start to describe the interactions controlling transcription initiation rate, well, you have to kind of make a lot of choices. You know, do you write down an atomic model? Mm -hmm. That's pretty overwrought, right? There's a lot of atoms. Uh, do you write down a coarse-grained atomic model? Uh, do you write down, um, you know, how many states are in the model, right? Um, and, you know, interestingly, uh, what we derived is that, it, you know, if you write down a two-state model and you make sure that RNA polymerase and sigma factor are limiting. That is, there's a lot more DNA compared to the enzyme. That means that it is, you know, you won't get accumulation of the intermediate states. So we have, a, again, a two-state model, initial state, final state, and we're pretty careful about defining what we mean by initial and final state in the, uh, multi-state, you know, energy profile as it, you know, goes through these cycles. Here, the initial state is, uh, you know, RNA polymerase and sigma factor are not bound to the promoter DNA. And the final state is when, yes, the enzyme is bound to the promoter DNA, the DNA is melted, pulled apart, and uh, the first nine nucleotides of the messenger RNA have been transcribed, come back around, formed a stable anchor called an R loop. And that anchor is really important to making sure that the enzyme stays on the DNA and enters into the processive elongation phase. If it can't get to that non-nucleotide anchor, it actually can, can uh, fall off, okay? And it has to start over uh, again. Um, and so because, um, you know, there's so many different states, uh, we, we wanted to come up with, the, again, a pretty simple equation, you know, uh, you know, in, in terms of, you know, uh, in the machine learning world, you want a really good, like, activation function, right? You want to pick mm -hmm. a simple equation uh, that you can parameterize really well. So it's kind of the same idea. Um, to quantitatively describe and relate the interactions between RNA polymerase and sigma factor and the transcription rate. We didn't want to start off with a highly nonlinear function. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. So what we're able to do through derivation is directly relate the log ratio of transcription rates. So we measured, you know, transcription rate Tx, really it's mRNA level, but you know, it's 
proportional to transcription rate. We measure that. We divide by a reference measured transcription rate. And so we pick, arbitrarily, we pick one of the promoters as a reference promoter, okay? Um, and it could, it could be the promoter with the uh, median transcription rate or the mean transcription rate uh, in the data set, okay? Which would be pretty typical from an ML point of view. Then, but we, from this derivation, we can, we, we can show that the log ratio of the transcription rates is equal to negative beta, and beta has a particular meaning in the thermal world, but it's a constant, uh, negative beta times the difference in free energies between the promoter sequence that we care about, that we're predicting, minus the reference, you know, that the gives free energy uh, for the reference promoters interactions, okay? And, you know, just like in the ML world, if you have a reference or a normalization, you know, like, think of it like a z-score, um, it's a little bit arbitrary how you normalize so long as the scaling is correct, okay? So here we can arbitrarily define delta G total ref as zero. It doesn't affect anything. It won't affect the machine learning. It won't, I mean, it'll, it'll just shift things up and down, but it won't, mm -hmm. you know, affect the, uh, uh, the outcome of the training. Right. Okay. And similarly, TX ref, again, uh, you pick a number um, that, well, you, you, you pick the, um, you pick the measured transcription rate uh, for the promoter that you picked as the uh, reference promoter. Mm -hmm. okay, so something in, the, let's say, in the middle of the data set. Okay. So you, you have this equation and it relates to, for us, it relates, uh, you can think of it like a transformation. It relates our measurements to the, the features of the sum of the features mm -hmm. that mattered. Okay. So delta G total is a sum of features. Uh -huh. Okay. In, in ML speak. What are those features? Well, that's where we, you know, put on our biophysics hat and we start to decompose this delta G total in terms of the physical interactions taking place between RNA polymerase and signal factor and the promoter DNA. Mm -hmm. And this is very much a artisanal decomposition. Mm -hmm. You can do it several different ways. And I mean, there's, you could say a more correct way would be the one that gave you a more accurate model mm -hmm. and more generalizable model. And so we did a lot of testing to make sure that we picked, you know, a good choice. Okay. And so when you were talking about the sort of hybrid um, biophysical plus machine learning aspects of things, um, like how does that, that comes into this equation because you're, you're handpicking the, the features that you want to include, right? Um, or can you, can you talk a little, little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. So uh, we are, we are handpicking with an expansive understanding of what is taking place, mm -hmm. uh, the, the features that are important. And, but mm -hmm. we're also uh, letting the ML, uh, we're, we're using a here uh, linear ML. So we, we okay. did a cross comparison between lasso, ridge regression, elastic net. They all gave us the same answer. They were all interchangeable. So uh -huh. it was a, a very solvable problem. Okay. Uh -huh. um, and, and so, but, but they're all linear, right? So it's class, the class is linear machine learning models. And now if you're an expert in ML, you'd be like, oh man, we did that in the, in the early nineties and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, you know, it works really, really well for a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. And in fact, people have shown that for a lot of modern problems, linear ML models work as good uh, mm -hmm. as deep learning. Um, in fact, requiring a lot less data, mm -hmm. um, uh, handling noise in a better way in many cases. Uh, and, they can't overfit, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you can't, uh, it's really hard to memorize a, a data set with a linear ML model. So in, in the class of linear ML, you have a set of variables or features, XI, and they can be numerical. So XI could be some real number, or it could be categorical. That is a, a binary zero or one. And in front of that you know, variable, you have a coefficient, CI. And you're just proposing as your hypothesis 
that the outcome, the predictor uh, mm -hmm. of the model is the linear sum of CIXI. Mm -hmm. That's C. And okay, so in, in many problems, you can transform something that you care about into a linear sum just like this. Mm -hmm. And if you can do that, then you absolutely should use linear yeah. ML. Uh -huh. Right? Makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, it's much, it's definitely worth the effort to see if you can linearize uh, your, your predictor. In the linear model you were just describing where you have um, a sum of, you know, constant terms times the, the features of the model. Um, what are the features yeah. that you're using here in, in this um, application? Sure. There are 346 features. Mm -hmm. There, you can see the slide, right? Okay. Um, yes, yeah. you, uh, there are, I, I've listed them out. Uh, there's two numerical features. We calculate, so we use an equation to calculate the width of the minor groove of the double-stranded DNA that is upstream, that is before, the negative 35 hexamer. And that actually closely uh, tracks the AT content of that DNA. So if you've ever heard in the literature, AT rich ups elements increase transcription rate, it's because AT rich sequences in, uh, increase the width of the minor groove. And which is a better binding pocket for alpha subunit. Mm -hmm. And so we, instead of just using AT content as a numerical feature, we instead use the better proxy, uh, the more physical, you know, causal proxy mm -hmm. uh, of that inter interaction, uh, which mm -hmm. is the uh, width of the minor group. Okay, but again, it's just an equation. Uh, okay, and it's only two numbers, right? Uh, other uh, equations would include, uh, you know, the, the rigidity of DNA in the spacer region. So the, the more rigid, uh, the, the less uh, that RNA polymerase can bend it without exerting more work. So higher rigidity typically gives you a lower transcription rate. Um, the length of the spacer is another numerical feature, although actually we, we decompose it as six categorical features. Um, uh, we... we Right, we, we chose to do that uh, to, to get more precision on it. Um, and then the other numerical feature is the stability of this uh, R loop. So there's a, what I like to call a DNA, RNA, DNA sandwich. <laughs> and, okay, it sounds funny. Um, this actually can be very stable. So depending on the sequence, um, and it's not like G's or C's are better. It's actually its own weird code. Mm -hmm. um, but you can calculate it, that certain sequences are more stable than others in this complex. Okay. And, and that has an effect on transcription. Um, all right. And then in terms of categorical, categorical features, which are of course very common in, mm -hmm. in ML, uh, we just enumerate out all possible, uh, uh, threemers. So there's two threemers. Uh, you know, uh, enumerating the next uh, negative 35 hexamer. Mm -hmm. There are two streamers for the negative 10 hexamer. There is one uh, former, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, one tumor um, for the negative 10 extended motif. Okay. And then there's one threemer for the discriminator. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so because DNA has four letters, if you have an, a K-mer, it's K to the fourth. Sorry, sorry, four to the K. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You edit that out. <laughs> I was just gonna edit, yeah, we'll, we'll remove that. <laughs> All right, okay. I corrected myself. Um, all right, so you, you have all the, okay, so when we say categorical, it's, a, it's an encoding. Uh, you're enumerating the things that can happen. If it happens, it's a, it's a one in that categorical variable. If it's not happening, it's a zero, okay? We could have encoded this six base pair sequence and this six base pair sequence. We could have encoded the negative 35 motif and the negative 10 motif, uh, you know, several different ways. It could have been, uh, uh, you know, three tumors, or it could have been um, 4,096 each mm -hmm. right, uh, variables. Um, 
and, and this is where the artisanalness of, of developing the model came in. We did, you know, do a trial and error in, in terms of the decompositions, but from a physical point of view, also the, you know, the sigma factors, amino acids contact the three left nucleotides and the three right nucleotides pretty independently. If you look at a structure, a crystal structure, uh, you can actually see the, the distances between the amino acids uh, and the DNA base pairings. And you can actually make a decision based purely on that. And it, as, it, as it so happens, that is the, you know, that is the uh, decomposition that gives you the highest accuracy with the smallest number of variables. Which is something that we, you know, prioritized. Yeah. Okay, so you, um, like, you are kind of handpicking these, but it's very biophysically informed when you're selecting the features. Right. The overall design rule here for the model: we want a model that is highly accurate, highly generalizable. We want to first, we want to know exactly how many parameters are in the model. We want to make sure that that number of parameters isn't so, such a large number. Right, right, okay. In terms of the model training, of course there's a pretty uh, rigorous workflow uh, that most everybody uses. You know, just like everybody else, we do tenfold cross-validation okay. uh, on a shuffled data set. We want to remove the possibility that we uh, accidentally have, you know, information leakage. Mm -hmm. so, so you first shuffle the data set, you take 80%, that's your trained test data uh, or trained validate. Uh, you take the remaining 20%, that's an unseen uh, mm -hmm. test set. You do cross-validation on your trained validate. So you are you know, taking 10% uh, you know, of uh, each, uh, setting it aside for validate. You train on 90%, you test on 10%, you, you know, rotate uh, mm -hmm. and you do it 10 times. Uh, so you really are generating 10 different models. Uh, out of tenfold cross-validation. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you look at the consensus model, make sure that it's been generalized uh, and accurate. Um, and then how do you really know that you don't have any information leakage? You then test on the unseen test set. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's what we're showing here. The training set um, is the, the body of data being used for that tenfold cross-validation. Mm -hmm. the, the test set, the body of data being is unseen data, uh, just being used on the final model at the end of the mm -hmm. process. And it's important that the, uh, you know, you can see that the, the outcomes from the data uh, follow the same distribution mm -hmm. in the training set versus the unseen test set. You don't want to skew uh, or have two skewed data sets, uh, which, which means that you're not really testing it, um, you know, evenly. And then, of course, it's also really important to have uh, and show the learning curve. You want to show people that you had enough data to train and test the model. Mm -hmm. And you see that from the learning curve by plotting the mean error uh, as you increase the training set size, uh, as you're training and testing the model. And what you should expect is that at some training set size, you should see convergence in the error between the train set and the test set. That means that if you add more data, you don't get a more accurate, more generalized model. Mm -hmm. Okay, which means you had enough data. Okay, to get, so if you, if the, if the number doesn't keep going down as you add more data, it means you basically have reached a, a level of uh, flatness uh, in, in the type of model that you're using, the types of variables that you're proposing as features, that's mm -hmm. the best it's ever going to be. If you add more data, it doesn't really help you, but at least you're showing the, the reader exactly how much data you needed to get to that point, okay? Right. And of course, it's important to have more than enough data. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, if the mean error on the test set never approaches the mean error on the train set, that means that either your features are bad, your model is bad, you don't have enough data, something's wrong. Um, I want to, you know, emphasize something. After you train and test and go through all this work developing a machine learning model, from my point of view, it's really important to understand what's happening inside the model. Right. Because mm -hmm. 
my purpose is not just to make some prediction. My purpose is to use those predictions in a myriad number of ways to design synthetic promoters, to predict transcriptional profiles, to design regulated promoters, mm -hmm. to build future models that build upon this model and so forth. And it's it's if it's a black box with a gazillion parameters, then you can't do much of that. You know, you're basically mm -hmm. stuck with what you have and that's it. Mm -hmm. But that's not what we built. So we have here, you know, we've learned the coefficients for each of these different interactions. Mm -hmm. We can show the, the coefficients and we can see that these coefficients mirror, you know, our understanding of how transcription takes place. So you can... <laughs> And just to yeah. make sure that um, this point is clear, by the coefficients you mean, like in the linear um, linear model, there were certain constant terms that were multiplying the different features, and these these weight them at different levels. And so the, those C sub i's are going to be larger or smaller depending on how important those particular features are. Correct. Is that correct? So, yeah. Okay. Yes. So if an interaction increased mm -hmm. transcription rate by a lot, uh, mm -hmm. it, it had, was given a very high negative number. So you can see on the scale, strong mm -hmm. is a negative coefficient, weak, positive coefficient, mm -hmm. and um, you know overall they vary between uh, negative one and one. Yeah. Um, and you know if you're a microbiologist and you scan across this table, you see all right negative thirty five exomer, oh TTG ACA, mm -hmm. negative ten exomer TAT AAT, bam, that's mm -hmm. that's the consensus negative Familiar. seventy yeah. or sigma seventy promoter. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so it makes sense. It means that the model did its job correctly. It mm -hmm. recapitulated known interactions. OK. Um, but then again, you look across this whole table. I'm only showing a portion of it. Um, mm -hmm. It tells you everything. Right. Mm -hmm. It tells you all the non canonical interaction strengths as well. Were there any surprises in here for you? Um, yeah. Um, everybody talked about the discriminator. Uh, mm -hmm. being, you know, GC rich and uh -huh. how that was really important to increasing transcription rate. Uh, we didn't really see that. Um, it, it's, if you look at the top 16 discriminators, um, they're not like, you know, GGG isn't there. Mm -hmm. Right. And so um, it, it's, but if you take the average top 16, mm -hmm. if you look at the GC content of the top 16, then it's like 66% GC. So it's like a weird proxy. Yeah. Uh -huh. So there's all these like anecdotal rules that are thrown yeah. around in the mm -hmm. field. And they're like indirect proxies of the actual thing. <laughs> okay. Yeah, which I, think, I mean, I think is really like motivating these more comprehensive studies like the ones you guys are doing. So we saw that a lot uh, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, there, there was some truth to the anecdote, but it wasn't the complete full truth. Yeah. So uh, so here, you know, we, we have different systems. We have transcription taking place in vitro. We have transcription taking place inside of cells when those promoters have been integrated into the genome. So they exist at like one to two copies. And then we have promoters which are expressing proteins on a multi-copy plasmid where the plasmid copy number per cell varies some number stochastic between like mm -hmm. here, like 20 to 60. Yeah. Okay. So you can see the difference. Mm -hmm. You can see that depending upon the context in which this promoter is living, when I say context, I mean like the distribution of copy number, the presence of RNAs, uh, you know, other things that are happening in terms of like alternative sigma factors being present, mm -hmm. um, you get more noise. Okay. Um, and this is, you know, the, the model, you can still see that the model is working. Is retaining, you know, accuracy. It's helping you control transcription. Let's say, mm -hmm. um, but definitely, it's not as uh, as accurate as you mm -hmm. as more of these confounding variables are being added. All right, designing. So now you can take that model, and you can use it to predict the transcription initiation rate of any arbitrary DNA sequence. You can take that model and embed it within an optimization algorithm. And then you can set a target transcription rate and you can design a non-natural DNA sequence to hit that target transcription rate. Mm -hmm. 
and it also you can you can as an additional design objective or set of objectives you can also say you only want one predominant peak where transcription will take place mm-hmm. you let's say you don't want transcription to take place at multiple different locations and you don't want transcription to take place backwards in the anti-sense direction mm-hmm. okay you can do that and so that's what the promoter calculator does. It, it design it's, a, it's really a multi-objective design because it's not just about targeting transcription at one location. It's also about minimizing transcription at all the other locations that you don't want. Mm-hmm. So when you do that, you get very, very good transcriptional control with high accuracy, uh, yeah. which we show across you know, 16 different uh, synthetic promoters. Okay. Um, so, of, of course, uh, the, uh, Travis and Ayan uh, were responsible for all the, you know, experimental and computational work. I just had the pleasure of talking about it and providing uh, advice on how to do it. Um, and uh, so, you know, thank you. Um, and, you know, we're, we're still not done. Uh, you know, we're uh, students in question are still uh, busy uh, developing the next generation of models, uh, including, uh, you know, uh, transcription rate.